there were no there were no mothers and wives and aunts to take care of you when you're in a man's prison, you know, and if you don't figure out how to sort of stretch your comprehension of what it means to be a human being and take care of yourself, you'll you'll hurt yourself. You'll become more damaged instead of, you know, uh, growing from the experience. Well, uh, I got lucky uh, in some ways. Uh, I grew up after the 60s and went to high school after the 60s, but in time to, uh, to have a good chance to think about all of that tumult in my childhood um, and decide what I thought of it. And then I went to Georgetown University and met a Jesuit priest at Georgetown who was one of the uh, one of the first to introduce peace studies to Catholic University. Uh, his name was Richard McSorley. I took his course, um, and he mentored me for uh, uh, until he died in 2002. Um, and I had the privilege of speaking at his funeral. Uh, but I had influences like that that just I lucked into, or you know, they happened and they made a difference, and they helped point me what I now consider the right direction. Well, it is the sustainer. You know, the Catholic worker movement uh, was something that Father McSorley uh, drew my attention to, and I got entirely enthusiastic about it initially in college. Um, and uh, it dates back to the Great Depression, and uh, Dorothy Day is its best known founder. And she was an old-fashioned social radical who had, uh, who had uh, you know, come into the Catholic Church, oddly enough, uh, uh, and, and stayed friends with all her communist and socialist and anarchist uh, comrades, uh, all the same, even though they thought it was very peculiar. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, she had lived a really heroic life and really showed a way to... Uh, to try and unplug from, uh, you know, what I would have thought up until college days so it was the trajectory you're supposed to follow with your life. Uh, go to a first class university like Georgetown and get a degree and, and succeed one way or another. I started in business school and finished with a sociology degree because that was so much more lucrative. Um, and, uh, by the time I was 25, I had stopped working for a paycheck altogether and moved into the local Catholic worker house. Um, so it's been a good ride, and uh, you know some of the some of the things that uh, are emphasized in in Catholic values uh, move me. Uh, mostly, you know, the prayer helps you stay sane and stable. Actually. Uh, Looking at a long religious tradition of uh, uh, the Catholic Church doesn't always get good press, but there's a line there's a long line of troublemakers in the Catholic Church going back to oh, that guy from Nazareth, um, and uh, so you learn to follow their cues and do fine. Uh, it's 40 years later, and I'm still. Well, the great part of having uh, what seems like uh, a routine job, director feels like such an overstatement, uh, uh, herder of finances feels like it might be more on, on track, but, you know, ostensibly I'm doing managerial work and work to take care of the organization's business, but I get lots of opportunities to spin around in my desk chair and work with interns, work with young people on a kind of a one-on-one -on -one creative basis, or to brainstorm with Michael and Mubarak when we all put our heads together and say, well, you know, I'm just the bookkeeper here, but 
really, you know, Gandhi in theory says we should think about doing this this way or we should try this attempt to things. And so there's a lot of room for collaborating and creativity and trying to imagine how to, um, um, you know, uh, run nonviolence's flag up the flagpole and hope that people notice it and say, what is a nonviolence international? So, that, you know, lots of opportunity for uh, those kind of um, work collaborations outside the job description. I can just, I can remember I can remember a couple of episodes. I I, I have basically worked about half time for four years, um, but you know we had a summer a fall where um, we had uh, three Moroccan young people uh, spending several weeks in the United States. Uh, Mubarak had a whole agenda for them that took them all over, at least the eastern part of the country, I think Ohio and New York, and maybe New England, and maybe Georgia. Um, but uh, they were on my hands for a couple of stretches of that, like picking up and meeting them. Uh, well, they're from Morocco, so I hope somebody speaks a little English, because my Arabic is this big. Uh, that would be a problem. But, you know, it was, for me, it was a treat to show them around Washington, the practicalities of hosting them and squiring them around, but also um, the learning and, and listening to the way they lived. This, you know, they were each from Morocco, two young men and one young woman, uh, and they were, they were all uh, Muslims um, and some more conventional than others. Uh, you know, uh, taught taught one of the men how to be a Red Sox fan, which is one of my uh, pageants. And, uh, you know, I don't know how many Muslim Red Sox fans there are. Probably a few, but not many. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, the young woman who was part of that group, mostly she wanted to know where she could pray all by privately, <laughs> which is a contrast to one of the one of the elders who came through from, from uh, Southeast Asia, who, who's also a Muslim woman, um, she'd just take her prayer rug and roll it out in the hall and, and expect that anyone who needed to go down the hall for any reason while she was praying would just have to go around her. Uh, this young woman, by contrast, I need some privacy for this. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, you got it. Uh, so, it was, it was, so that was an interesting encounter for me because, you know, not only was I providing some tour guide, uh, and hospitality for them, but I, I learned, you know, I learned a good bit that I didn't know just by, uh, you know, quizzing them while we were driving around town in the car. Uh, that was a, that was a, you know, I like being able to learn. I, and I hope, you know, I'm, I'm past sixty now, but uh, I I like learning new things and I, I like the opportunities um, and. Uh, so that's rich. And then one of the other things that I got to do, I did some, and I, and I continue to do now in another context, is to develop some work um, in support of the Plowshares Movement, um, which I know we'll talk about a little bit more, um, and spend some time uh, trying to explain it to people. And uh, uh, in the middle of my uh, January of 16, I spent three weeks with Sister Megan, who my friend Sister Megan will be 90 in January, but she had just gotten out of jail uh, from serving a sentence for a plowshares action in Tennessee, and we did a three-week speaking tour in Europe that nonviolence facilitated a great deal of some of the contacts, giving me the time, uh, allowing me to do outreach um, through nonviolence to support network. So this, this is what we want to do. We ended up going to five, um, six countries, seven, Six countries, seven cities in three weeks, uh, which is a pretty hefty pace for uh, Megan was was then a 86 year old woman. She turned 86 while we were on the trip, and so we had we had a birthday party each week. I just told her, you know, January is her birthday. We should have a party, and uh, worked out great. Um, well, the Plowshares movement, I think, has been an enduring thing, which is a great thing in itself, um, and 
in the early 1980s, I first got exposed to that. The first of those actions took place in the September of uh, 1980, 39 years ago. Um, and, uh, my former wife was involved in an action a couple of years later, before we got married. Uh, in fact, uh, up until a week before we got married, she was at trial. Uh, and then um, in 1984, I was involved in an action in Florida. Eight of us went into a Pershing missile weapons factory in Orlando that was operated by a company called Martin Marietta at the time. They changed their name. Consolidated with another company, but um, we went into uh, uh, Easter, Passover, and Earth Day all rolled into one day, April 22nd in 1984, in the middle of the night. Got into uh, a warehouse containing missile parts and put blood on them, hammered on them, unfurled banners, said prayers, and waited for the powers that be to come. Landed on us like a ton of bricks, which they good about doing, uh, um, but they were quite perplexed and eight people were wandering around their um, warehouse at four in the morning um, without authorization, um, at least not from that, no authorization from that. Uh, but uh, I ended up getting, spending 20 months in federal prison as a result of that. Um, and that was quite a powerful experience in its own right. Um, and there were, all eight of us got the same 21, got the, got the same three year sentence, which meant serving as much as 24 and a half months in jail. And I served 20 and then got paroled. And, uh, um, and, you know, when I got out, I stayed involved in supporting the Plowshares movement doing research and doing formation of individuals and action groups. Um, and uh, I stepped away from that a little bit uh, in the 90s when I was raising youngsters and needing to earn some money to support them. Uh, and I've gotten, you know, reinvested in that in the last few years. Uh, um, so, you know, and now there's been over 100 plowshares actions, which we never imagined when I did my action in 1984. That was the eighth one. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, you wonder how long this is going to go. You know, only as long as we have Reagan around, because he just is, you know, antagonizing the disarmament movement. And there was a mass movement. It's, you know, our, our actions were simultaneous with the, the apex of the freeze movement that we did. Uh, you did see um, nuclear missile agreements, the very Pershing missiles that we uh, hammered on uh, were, you know, Gorbachev and Reagan, uh, you know, abolished those by treaty. Um, when that treaty lasted up until a certain guy from a tall building in New York uh, took over the White House and threw that out the window and kept with everything else. Um, but, you know, you would never imagined that a weapon system that was anticipated to be vital to the U.S. national security profile for 20 or 25 years would have gone out of business in four. Um, so that felt like a really tangible accomplishment that we contributed to. And, uh, you know, now we have a situation where there's so many things to be alarmed about at least three things a day, depending on what time the president gets up and tweets. Um, that uh, paying attention to something as substantial and uh, harrowing as the as the nuclear arsenal is poised, you know, pointed at the at the life of the earth, uh, isn't everybody's focus. Um, uh, even though uh, the bulletin of the atomic scientists has said. Uh, it's two minutes to midnight. By virtue of the combination of the nuclear threat escalating again, uh, and the Russians and the Chinese and the Americans are not talking to each other about restraining nuclear weapons anymore. Um, and climate change, you know, well, two 
minutes to midnight means to, that means two minutes to the to the human uh, endeavor possibly going out of business. And uh, I never, I'll tell you, when I was a young activist, I never imagined that um, humanity or the earth could go out of business in my lifetime or my kids' lifetime. But now I think it's scary possible. That's which is heavy, but you know. Right now, there's seven people waiting to face trial in Georgia uh, for going to a Trident weapons, uh, Trident submarine base in Georgia, at Kings Bay, Georgia, and going in uh, on the anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination um, to take the same kind of action I described us as taking, challenging uh, nuclear weapons, challenging Trident submarines, which are the most lethal weapon system in the earth, on Earth, a single Trident. Uh, Commander is the most, is the third most powerful guy in the world, um, just by virtue of um, being at the helm of that uh, submarine. And uh, our friends, some of our friends have been in jail for a year and a half. Some of the seven people who did that action, and we are getting ready to see their trial begin October 21st, a month from now. Um, and. Uh, it's finally, we're finally getting some traction as far as people are noticing that this is it. This action is happening, and we had 100 people in Brunswick, Georgia, in August for a pre-trial hearing, and we expect to have hundreds uh, joining us next month um, to make a real public uh, witness out of questioning Trident, not their action, but the Tridents that they acted against, which are the real war crime here. Um, you know, there was a, there, I remember when we prepared for our action and then we went through our trial, you know, kind of had the idea that, you know, you will go through the trial if you're very lucky, the jury won't convict you. Odds are they will, and then you go to prison for some time, and that will be that, you know, will complete your witness. And uh, by the time I had been in jail any length of time, even not long after getting arrested, began to realize when you consider, when you, when you contemplate what's going around you in jail, and we weren't in the most hideous places on earth, uh, although we saw some hideous things, uh, you know, I did encounter uh, men who were condemned to death condemned to the electric chair in Florida. Um, uh, I did witness another prisoner uh, take his own life in the cell across from me when I was in a holding cell, holding a holdover unit in Atlanta. Um, uh, you, get, you get an eyeful of the ugliness of our prison system and it wasn't nearly as intensely populated as it is now, 35 years later. Um, but you realize that, you know, your witness isn't done, your work is just beginning. And, uh, and so, for example, uh, years later, and even, on, even as late as um, two years ago, I've been sporadically involved in Puerto Rican solidarity work with Puerto Ricans who are not all about nonviolence. They're not pacifists philosophically or practically, but you know, the liberation uh, activists and fighters. And I started to learn about Puerto Rico when I was in jail with a Puerto Rican political prisoner who was re refused to testify to a grand jury about the Puerto Rican independence movement. We spent, we got into a whole routine. So I got quite an education and I stayed involved in that concern. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, it, made, it was more of a finishing school for f further activism than the end of a, of a chapter for me um, by the time I left Hollywood. Um, and, uh, you know, you learn a lot about how to take care of yourself in jail. Um, and, and you get into the actual peculiar experience of men looking out for other men, uh, taking care of it, because 
There were no there were no mothers and wives and aunts to take care of you when you're in a men's prison, you know, and if you don't figure out how to sort of stretch your comprehension of what it means to be a human being and take care of yourself, you'll you'll hurt yourself. You'll become more damaged instead of, you know, uh, growing from the experience. So that was an interesting uh, phenomenon as well. Um, but uh, I, you know, I went through that experience uh, in a minimum security camp, certainly not in one of the hideous hell holes that, um, that Oscar Lopez Rivera, the Puerto Rican independentista who President Obama fired just before he left office and spent most of his adult life uh, several years worth of that being in solitary and in a control unit um, and it's amazing I finally met Oscar face to face and after that in Puerto Rico and he's an amazing human being for having been put through that hideous experience um, so you learn to understand how people um, you know come through come through ugly um, and oppressive the dignity and decency. Uh, it has to be self-maintained. Nothing in the system is going to support you in being decent and dignified. Well, years before I came to work in nonviolence, I worked for two different organizations. Uh, again, ostensibly as an operations staff person, but with an activist portfolio, uh, I worked for Rights Action and then I worked for Witness for Peace. And uh, just seeing a whole array of ferment in Latin America, I learned a lot about Guatemala and Honduras and Colombia, and I knew a little bit more about Nicaragua and Cuba and Mexico beforehand. But you know what it takes for, you know, even compared to the United States, for grassroots movements to sustain themselves and take care of themselves and not be shattered by the, oh, let's say, you know, Guatemala's history of a, uh, of a nearly 40 year long um, so-called civil war. I don't think there's such thing as civil wars as a matter of course. They're pretty uncivil. Um, and certainly uh, the Guatemalan regime was, they, you know, their, their warfare against um, the indigenous people in Guatemala involved all manner of genocide, uh, um, and not just rhetorical genocide, but really wiping out whole villages and massacring, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of people. Uh, so certainly not just combat casualties, but just uh, terrorizing the countryside um, over and over and over again. And yet, um, you know, somehow, uh, somehow there's some perseverance and some resilience in in those same people. Uh, even in the sh few years after they signed a formal peace agreement and there was less bloodshed and more space for, you know, poor and indigenous Guatemalans to, uh, you know, get a hold of their lives. You saw, you know, ancient herbal medicine techniques uh, being restored, um, Mayan languages uh, getting new vitality, uh, flourishing a little better than they had um, under repression um, and uh, all manner of, of, you know, social and cultural um, comeback uh, just because there was less, um, less fear and terror uh, afflicting their lives. Um, and that's to say 40 years of repression didn't, didn't shatter them. Uh, uh, so that's that's good to understand that people can can uh, can abide through um, some you know uh, ghastly terrors um, for sure, and uh, you know you see that uh, repeatedly. There's you know there's grassroots movements that are maintaining very pitched battles, uh, and and generally you know I mean some you know sure there's the FARC in Colombia. Guatemalan armed resistance, but you know, uh, 
there's 50,000 um, varieties of, of organizing and, and initiatives that are generally involve nonviolence, um, creativity, uh, flexibility, adaptability, and perseverance uh, about affirming themselves and resisting their antagonists uh, that, that flourish, you know, that spread up all over the place, which is why some of these civil wars last 50 years because of um, the powers that be are, you know, as, as ruthless as they are, basically playing whack-a-mole with resilient grassroots movements, indigenous women's movements, um, and the like, and, uh, you know, they can be they can be very repressive, but they can not um, shatter them. And uh, that's, that's very, you know, fascinating, fascinating and hopeful to see um, when you consider how long, you know, some of those uh, campaigns of warfare have gone on and, and yet the people stand up and hold their heads up uh, in the moments that it abates. Well, I mean, in terms of hope, you know, I've, I've seen some of those examples that I talked about, uh, you know, movements for peace and justice and, and human dignity that persevere against uh, some frightful um, experiences of being terrorized. Uh, so that tells me that it's doable and that, you know, the violent are not going to have the last word on it, for one thing. I think like to see people focus on nonviolence per se and on deepening their understanding of what it means. I think sometimes I'm hearing a little, uh, at least vocabulary fatigue with the idea of nonviolence among some activists. And I just want to say, well, but you know, nonviolence is where we want to go. So it's how we need to go. And instead of thinking of it as, um, Passing and oh, vaguely reminiscent of the 60s and um, not adequate to the challenges we're up against. Um, how are you going to overthrow the violence of capitalism or racism or you know, greed and violence uh, without it? So we need to get um, more imaginative and more creative about um, making it applicable to the many, uh, many frontiers we have to like for the world up. Um, so uh, I guess if, if I was a classroom teacher, that's what I'd be trying to tell people. This has been Paul Magnus speaking with Nonviolence International. Thank you so much for watching.